In our culture today, we have often inflated the meaning of words. So when we talk about someone who is a genius, we have a tendency to have watered that down to include bright students in our elementary classroom, even our own children because we find them special. Um, genius gets watered down to include maybe all of us at some point, but I want to introduce you to a man who truly was a genius. This is the influence of Augustine. This is a little bit about his life story as we get ready to study a couple of his books. Augustine was born right on the hinge between the ancient world and the medieval world. The Roman Empire is falling apart. It's having a, an increasingly difficult time holding back the Germanic tribes that are slowly encroaching on the borders. And some of them are making peace with Rome, and there's becoming a new ethnic mixture in areas of, of that Rome has previously held. And some of them have been more hostile, like the Vandals, right into Rome. And so right during this time, a man of the stature of Augustine uh, comes into view. And Augustine, in this, in this period that is a hinge between the ancient world and the medieval world, he begins to lay the groundwork for medieval theology. And so he is influential both in the formation of Roman Catholic doctrine, and then he is the hero of the Protestant reformers. They look back to him and they use him as a reference uh, for reasons to go on with the Reformation. So he lays the groundwork for both medieval theology and the Roman, the Protestant Reformation. He's, as I said, he's a genius. He's gifted in most every, almost every way. He possesses immense gifts of rhetoric, and uh, so he is able to impart that to his students. I mentioned that uh, before becoming a priest, he was a teacher of rhetoric, which was the most sought after area of education because if I could get my student into one of Augustine's classes, being trained by him in the art of persuading others uh, meant that there was a good chance my child would have more power, more wealth, more influence in the public square. And so everybody clamored to get their children into Augustine's classes because he was a rhetoric teacher with great skill. So that's Augustine. And uh, he's born 354, dies in 430. Uh, his parents, it was a, a mixed, a spiritually mixed marriage. His mother was Monica. She was a believer in Christ. His father was a pagan, but involved in public service and also wanting the best for his son. Um, and so Augustine got the, the best of training, uh, both in classical philosophy, reading some of the things we will study from the ancient world, like Plato and Cicero. Augustine, for a while, dabbled with Manichaeanism, which was sort of a heretical offshoot of uh, Christianity and dualism. Uh, he was Dualism says that the powers of good and the powers of evil are virtually equal. Um, they emphasize the spiritual world, and they, the spirit is always at war with the flesh. And so that's the kind of dualism we're talking about. Uh, in the Confessions, Augustine says that uh, the leaders taught that no one should marry or have children, and the leaders themselves would eat only fruit. They would send their disciples out to gather the fruit. They wouldn't do it themselves, and the disciples would bring them fruit, and then they ate it. Um, and, of course, the key difficulty in Manichaeanism was they denied Jesus' humanity. But Jesus was God, uh, but he was an emanation and not incarnate human being. There are three incidents that we'll probably spend some time on when we study confessions. Uh, one is we'll pay attention to um, the influence of Augustine's mother, Monica over and over and over again he says as he would make steps to wander away from god he would then stop and praise god for having a praying mother who 
like restraining mercy would hold Augustine back from further sin until he could eventually find his rest in God. Um, there is a particular situation in uh, Augustine's teenage years that I call here the pear tree incident in which Augustine wrestles with a juvenile thing that he did. Uh, all of us do wrong things. Uh, it's part of our sinful nature. Most of the time we like to excuse them. I did this, but I did it because of something else. And while I know it's bad, it's not as bad because I have this great excuse right? Sometimes people will come to me as a pastor and say, well, I know what God really wants me to do in this situation, but you know, it, it, taking into account all that I have gone through, this is the, the best decision, and I think God would, God would understand. <sighs> the things we do to try to get out from under the consequences of our actions. Well, this pear tree incident for Augustine sat in his conscience and wouldn't let go. He spent six pages in the Confessions talking about this pear tree incident. His neighbor had a pear tree. The pears are rich and ripe and full. And he and some friends, just to be juvenile, just to be malicious, they harvest the pears, they pick up the pears, and they drag them away and then throw them out. The neighbor is angry, and when Augustine begins to think about what they did, he can't come up with a good reason for it. He didn't do it to the pears because he was hungry, because they threw out the pears. Uh, he didn't sell them to make a profit, uh, because they just threw them out. It was, it was pure juvenile maliciousness, and so he couldn't let it out of his head. And it began to draw him toward the idea that all of us are born in sin and we enjoy malicious activity apart from Christ. Doing something like this that's just stupid is prodded on by our sinful nature. And it's one of those things that began to help Augustine to understand where he stood in light of Christ. And then, of course, we have the story of Augustine's conversion in which some of his friends have become uh, believers in Christ. Uh, he's fallen under the He's been going to hear the priest Ambrose speak, uh, who was an excellent speaker, and Augustine enjoyed hearing him. Um, but as he's wrestling with what he should do and where he stood in relationship with God, he's sitting in a, in a garden, and he hears, he's, he's got his Bible there, and he hears some kids calling, take up and read. Sounds like the words that might come from a children's game. But he picks up the book and he reads about uh, the kind of Christian life that God calls us to. And he chooses at that point. It's a signal event in his life that causes him to choose Christ. Um, I don't think it's near the child's game as the mother's prayer. <laughs> but anyway, Augustine is converted and uh, he eventually becomes a priest right in, in Milan. And uh, as the Germanic hordes begin to approach, he's uh, writing about what could come and how, in spite of the fall of the physical government in Rome, God's kingdom stands. So there are three texts that we're going to be looking at. Uh, I've already described some pieces from the Confessions, which is his account of his coming to faith. And then we have the city of God in which when he looks around at the contemporary political situation, he says that the city of man may be going away, but the city of God is coming and so this is his description of those two places, both of which a Christian has responsibility in, but our confidence is in the city of God. And then there's a book called On Christian Doctrine, which is his presentation of the ideas of rhetoric in Christianity and his defense of using all kinds of different academic disciplines, all truth no matter where it's found, as evidence for the Christian faith because all truth coheres, it fits together. And it's a great description of ways in which uh, we might make our ministry more effective in presenting the gospel 
in a persuasive way. So that's what we have in these three texts. I think you're going to like reading Augustine and his ideas, and I look forward to walking through them with you. Thanks.